Welcome to Cut It Out, the, well, as far as I know, the only collage podcast in the entire known world. Boys and girls, it's a very exciting day. I have seen on the horizon many, many layers, and above us is the moon, and with us is the one and only Post Wook. She is an awesome digital collage artist, and if you follow Collage on Instagram, without a doubt, you have seen her awesome, surreal landscapes. Now, in this interview, we get some really awesome uh, tidbits of wisdom from Post Wook because she's worked with some really awesome big-name clients. She has a background in law and policy, so she gives us some really cool perspective about copyright and derivative work. And she's generally a really awesome person. So, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, aliens and crustaceans, thank you for listening. Let's get into the conversation. Okay. So, Natasha, thank you so much for being on the show. And um, I think most people know you as Post Wook. Yeah. <laughs> I got to say, I... Um, I'm very fond of fond of your name, uh, Post Wook. Um, I love the live music scene. I miss it very much right now. I was wondering, um, could you tell us why you named yourself Post Wook? Yes. So, like you, I miss the live music scene. I kind of like came up in festival world, um, and really like was just a Wook. Like I can't even like just going from greyhound to flight to car just like getting around if like there's a phrase like if there's a look there's a way like if you want to go on tour with a band you will do it and uh that was very much my vibe um and then really like what happened in my life was i had since graduated from college got like a full-time job and i was like i really wanted to go to this festival in swanee uh florida at the like park there it was called it's called Halloween takes place around Halloween and it was in 2017 and I had to convince my boss to t let me leave just let me go and I wasn't super honest about it I like told him I was going on a family vacation which wasn't necessarily true and um ended up working out but I remember at that event it was like a Wednesday when I flew down to Florida and I had shipped all my camping stuff to one of my friends to drive it in and I just remember I went from working a half day to taking this flight and we drove through the night from the airport to the festival. And um, I was transported from a working environment and like a professional world to this festival. And if you've never been to Swanee, if you're deep in the forest, you will find a tree. I don't know if it's there anymore, but there was this tree that was like covered in bras. And like, that was the moment that I was like, oh my God, my life is just so different than what it was when I used to do all this stuff just for fun, but it's still like this. So the name post Wook, it really started in that forest at that festival. And the whole idea was like, when you look at like post rock music, right? Like it has influence from rock music without being rock music. So the idea behind post Wook is like, it pulls influences from like Wook and festival culture without that. So like, I very much feel, still feel attached to like that part of my life, even though it's not like identified with who I am presently today. So that's like really where that kind of came from. Um, cool. People think it's a Star Wars reference a lot. It's not. <laughs> no. yeah. Now, is there um, particular uh, bands or music types that you really like, you just absolutely needed to see? Is there, was there a particular band that drew you to the festival in Florida in the middle of the woods where you're like, I really got to see these guys? Yes. And um, as of yesterday, it's probably a hotter button topic than it should be. Uh, well, it, it needs to be now, but... Um, kind of a hot button issue and very much not, it's, it's a contemporary answer that won't be the same, but I was one of those people that followed Bass Nectar around the country. Bass I've seen Nectar. Bass Nectar live nice. over 40 times. Um, I was one of those people. And um, obviously there was a Vice article that came out about him yesterday that was pretty much like a huge expose. And like, he's he has stepped down from everything. Oh yeah, he's never going on tour again. Like a lot of things with like 
sexual harassment came out and it's like really, really bad. And that kind of unfolded like over the summer. So everyone knew that he was over, but like this article is like a huge tell all. So it's a little weird being like, oh yeah, I followed Basic around, but like that was the truth back then, you know? Um, just so, to double check, just to double check, did you happen yeah. to see him at the All Good Music Festival in West Virginia? Were you no, I've never been to All Good, but I've heard oh, about All Good. I was wondering so, if you were ever standing on the same mountain at a certain point. Oh, that, that would have been funny. Yeah. <laughs> but th- I mean, he brought me everywhere. Like, I went to Swanee pretty much to see him and to see, like, my friends. And um, he was always, like, like, that was always, like, the main attraction for me at festivals. But then I got to know, like, a lot of other artists, right? So, like, he was, like, the first one. But then I really liked going to see Pretty Lights when he was still doing stuff. Sound Tribe Sector 9, huge one for me. Um, I really love seeing the Disco Biscuits live, which I know is kind of controversial because some people <laughs> like don't like them. Um, they're not as like hated, I think, as like widespread panic, but they definitely still have a reputation. Um, I will say the Disco Biscuits played a fire set at um, at uh, Swanee that year. That was a really good one. Um, String Cheese Incident, really like String mm-hmm. Cheese. Um, mm-hmm. And then obviously I really like funk. So I'm always going to be a fan of seeing like Mo and Lettuce and Joe Russo's Almost Dead. Um, I'm just like a big fan. I had my bachelor party at Mo Down. Did you really? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I'm here for that. That's amazing. (laughs) So you, so um, yeah, like Mo, like my my buddies and I, we were really like we had an awesome situation where. We we lit, we went. I went to college in Rochester, New York, and we had friends mm-hmm. in Ithaca. We had friends in Boston, and we would pretty much just like crash at each other's like college places, and you know, always hit up um, Mo Fish, um, uh, Soul Live. I don't know a whole bunch of different uh, bands, and yeah, awesome time. But now you mentioned Lettuce, and those yeah. guys are super funky. Um, oh. A musician from Buffalo used to be. Um, in that band so i got to see him a couple times it was sick and you did some work for them right what did what what did you do for lettuce so um one of their posters from their new year's eve show is some of my art um it's really not that exciting but um it was really cool for me because like i remember when i found lettuce it was like bonnaroo 2015 and i was like why are they called lettuce like i like <laughs> that's what attracted me and then i was like Oh, and then I listened to the music and I was like, I love this. And then I think, I don't think I made it to the set. Mm-hmm. I used to be a little bit of a liability. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't think I made it to the set, but that's what like planted the seed. And then I just became like a huge fan. And I've seen Lettuce since. I saw Lettuce play with Mo actually. Um, Sweet. I think in like 2015, I saw them later that year because... I was like, I have to see them because I didn't, you know, I had to like make a redemption for myself. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was fun. Yeah. Festivals. Yeah. If you've never been, you got to drink your water. You got to take care of yourself. You got to get shade. Uh, I recommend not having a beer till it's like the sun goes down because the sun will just zap you. So um, zap you. Especially yeah. at a festival like Bonnaroo in the middle of Tennessee with no shade covering normally. Like the only shade that you get there is the shade you bring there. Yeah, and, I'm a, um, I can't I can't handle that. I, that would destroy me. I couldn't do yeah. it. It's really easy to not to miss people you want to see at a festival like Bonnaroo because you cannot pretty much pretty much unless you're very prepared, you shouldn't leave your campsite until the sun goes down. Whoa. Because it's it gets really like That's it's really hot, hot. and it, there's no shade, <laughs> but um, it's a fun one. I like it. It's a good catch all. Oh, man, I, I'm so excited for. I don't know when it's gonna happen again, but I'm just excited to go to like some of my local smaller places to see some. I just want to see a Grateful Dead cover band at this point. Like mm-hmm. I, I really don't. I really don't care. You know what I mean? I just want to wait in line at a venue bathroom. <laughs> that's where i'm at i want to wait for water i want to like buy a red bull at a bar mm-hmm. with just using my mouth like like red bull. <laughs> <laughs> that's perfect that's like perfect. i just that's where i'm at at this point like i just want that experience like, yeah we're really not asking <laughs> for much are we <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh man um so i going to ask you more about um some of your work because mm-hmm. I think any artists, 
we're always wondering like how do you work with um your favorite bands bigger clients like i was looking at your website you've worked with toyota sony club med red light and zillow yeah. now are these are these do they just find you because like i've only had a couple i don't know if you call them brand deals or influencer deals or whatever and one i recently did with mountain dew and that's cool they, yeah it was pretty neato yeah. and they, <laughs> neato. they found me um it, it was like the lowest effort thing and i was wondering like did these companies find you did you reach out i'm sure there's more than one story but how did like, how, um how did you work with these people that's super awesome 99 percent of the time they find me mm -hmm. um actually for all of the ones that you mentioned, they found me. So um, that's pretty much the way that I've gotten most client work. Um, there have been a few things that I've done that have been like through friends of friends, but for the most part, um, people find me through social media um, and they reach out through social media, even if they know me from friends of friends, just because that's like the easiest way for me to um i think like for them to kind of see what's going on because then they can like see the work they know what i'm capable of doing they have a contact you know like number right there and it just like is the easiest thing um it is really cool like having brands reach out to you because you just like never know who's actually out there watching right like i think that's like the coolest part about just like social media in general is like we're all so connected and like people that you think are so far away from you like really aren't um, which sure. I find really fascinating. Yeah. So. so let's break that down for a second. Like when Mountain Dew reached out to me, it was like an, it was technically an ad agency and yeah. a young woman reached out. She said, Hey, we're trying to target like a certain, um, we're trying to target like, you know, upstate New York. And you said you're in Buffalo and like, yeah, it sounded like a young woman that probably just uses Instagram already was digging around and they liked my style. Mm -hmm. and they asked me to do it. Is was that mm -hmm. a similar vibe, kind of a similar situation for you? Yeah. So most projects that I've worked on, um, the either the brand itself or their um, their agency will reach out to me, and then we'll work that way. So it just depends. Sometimes there's like like mediaries between things where like it's either a manager or an agent um but like between me and the artist or you know it's like the marketing team um so usually there's some form of like third party involved sometimes it is an agent on my end too um mm -hmm. but it just depends on like the project and then sometimes it's literally just the artist being like yo i think your stuff is dope and even if like they are like a bigger artist like they're the ones that, that are reaching out to me like i did this awesome project at the end of last year and the person who reached out to me initially was the label manager, right? But then I got on a call with like the manager, the label, the photographer, and it was, that was like the big thing. And then all of their correspondence after that was with the artist himself. Like we were literally texting, you know, it just depends because sometimes people want to be really involved and then sometimes they really don't. So it just like, it's just, it's just a, like a, it's just a circumstantial is the best word. Sure. Is. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, that's great. And it's it's awesome to know that you literally could just be posting and the right people will see it and they'll reach out. And yes. Now, do they try to leverage, like you have a ton of Instagram followers, right? How many followers do you have? <laughs> uh, I think I've got like, I'm like nearing 240, 240,000. Do um, so um, um, when these people hit you up, these brands, do they want you to like plug their product on their stuff or do they like just like want your your art depends and i try to get that information out of them beforehand sometimes i do not um sometimes they try to come back later and ask for like marketing and then at that point like personally i will hit them with the thanks so much it was really great working with you on the commission for this piece um just so you know if you want to continue and do marketing these are my marketing rates this is an additional cost from the work that i've already done um and then they usually disappear because they don't realize that it's actually going to cost them more money um but for the most part 
if they want it up front, I'll like bundle it just because if they, if people like you get what you ask for, that's really how I feel. Right. So like, even with clients, like the more honest and upfront they are in the beginning, like the more I'm going to want to work with them. Um, so for me, like it, the, the marketing, right. Is usually just like them wanting me to post something once or twice and just like kind of plug it out. But it just depends on how much of a plug they want. You know, and like, I always will share things to my story just because like, it's good for my portfolio and good for people to see what I'm doing. Sure. But if they want me to be like, oh, like swipe up and do and then it's like, okay, yeah, you, you need, I need some budget for that because I do have a yeah. platform that I have made over time, countless hours. Like I've spent more time on Instagram than I've spent doing literally anything else for the past three years, probably besides, no, I've probably been on Instagram more than I've been asleep in the past three years. So that's. Right? You did a lot of hard work and you, you gained a lot of followers. And um, I understand like when I, something, I'm mm -hmm. like, people, if people go to an Instagram account, I feel like they kind of want to be immersed in your vibe, whether it's the art or whatever it is, you know? And so to, yeah, to ask like, Hey, swipe up so you can get a free Bic razor or something. It's like, dude, no, that's going to totally. That's that's gonna cost me some money. Yeah, yeah. And throw the whole vibe off, and um, that's cool that you you know stuck to your guns for that. You know. That's, yeah, that's for me, like marketing like, budget. Sure, is I don't know, know, but you know, that's great that you stick to your guns. You know. It, it yeah. It also like just depends because sometimes I will like tell people I because it's even like with those like you were mentioning earlier like influencer projects right like I would never take a pro like a client that and th that they wanted me to post like in feed if it wasn't relevant to my audience right so like for me like travel obviously is relevant like with club med that was super relevant because like everything i post is a landscape everything i post is from like all over the world like it made sense for me to do that sure. um like the toyota thing was like a van life thing which was perfect and like a music festival so it's like that's where a lot of my followers like that's what they like anyway if like i don't know like i pickle company hit me up and they were like we would love for you to post like make this art and post it on your instagram i'd be like i don't really know because i'm not really like food centered like that might not work um and i've told people that i've told people they're like could you put this on your feed we'll pay you and i'm like i just don't think that i have the curated audience because even if you put something in front of 240,000 people if it's not the right 240,000 people it's not worth it so i think that's like a big part of it too um it's interesting you say that though, because people sometimes want the vibe, but sometimes they really don't. It just depends. Um, I learned that today, actually. Uh, oh. Sorry, but yeah. Huh? What do you mean? So I put swimsuits on my website today and they're doing really well and people are really excited, but I've also lost like 200 followers from it um, because apparently like posting photos of your body in the swimsuit is considered like really off brand. Um, and that's been really, uh, jarring for me to kind of like deal with today because like some people are just like, I had like one guy who was just like so ridiculously rude. Um, and I like screenshotted what he said and I put it on my story and I put it on Twitter and people were just like, this is ridiculous. Like, I can't believe this person would say this, like defending me, but, um, obviously that sentiment was shared with a few other people. Um, because in the past like 24 hours, I've lost like 200 followers, which is like more followers I lost than like during the Black Lives Matter stuff in June, uh, which is really alarming to me that like a woman's body is more jarring than people like, like civil unrest. I don't know. Um, yeah, like, no one's ever know. seen a woman in a bikini on Instagram. Like, what are we oh my like? God. It, literally with my assistant too, who works like her other job is a bartender at a bikini bar. Like that's her job. So it's just like for people to get that offended, I was like, this is so bizarre. Um, but I think the other thing with that and with the vibe and for anyone listening, who's like, I don't know how much of my brand or my personality I want to put on the internet. If you have a personality, show that, show people that. Because like for me, the way I kind of am looking at this is like, yeah, maybe like the metrics weren't great, right? In the sense of like I lost followers. The people who were really excited for the swimsuits bought them and they're very happy, right? And the people who saw that I like said something, they have like a better understanding of what I'm about. And they if they agree with it, then they feel connected, right? So it's just like the way that I feel is, yeah, you might like have some fallout for being yourself, but you're never going to lose the people who need to be there. 
So if you're listening right. and you're scared about like your voice on the internet, if you have a voice, I would use it. That's my advice. But you didn't yeah. ask one. But here it is. Anyone, <laughs> to, anyone, no, it's great advice. Anybody who wants to grow their social media, you have to get rid of perfection. You have to, and you have to get rid of the thought that like, oh, what if some people don't like this? Because then mm. you'll never post or you won't post enough that Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and Twitter that they want you to do, which is it's it's a rat race. I enjoy it because it's it's a pop art uh, rat race. I try to like embrace the inner Andy Warhol. Like, hey, mm. Andy Warhol mm-hmm. made 500 who knows, a thousand soup cans. He embraced the mechanical means of production. Um, so I guess, yeah, I gotta get, gotta let go of perfectionism and, you know, screw those people, man. Like, whatever. And um, I did, you sell, did, you sell, <laughs> did you sell any bikinis? Sold a ton of them. <laughs> there you a go. A ton of them. That's awesome. Yeah. We like, yeah, we're laughing all the way to the bank with that stuff. I mean, that's the thing. It's just like, I'm, for me, like selling bikinis and like t-shirts and stuff like that, like that doesn't really pay the bills. Like it does to an extent. It's more about people being able to wear something that they feel connected to in public. And then hopefully maybe one day someone will be like, yo, I know that artist. That's super cool because that's what it's about for me. Right? Like so many people have hit me up and told me that they've made friends obviously before the pandemic, because they looked at someone's phone background and it was the same artist as their phone background. And both of that, those artists were me. And it was just like, to me, that's so cool. Like when I meet people in person, they're like, you've been my phone background for like six years or something. And I'm like, I haven't been making art for six years, but congrats, you know? And it's just like, they're so excited. And that's it's cool. just like, to me, like I don't make any money off of someone screenshotting something and making it their phone background, but that's not the point. The point is that like, they're connected to something that's bigger than them. And like, that's what this is for me too. So, you know, it's really about like creating that community in my opinion, that like, this is about, and it just, maybe that's why it hurts because I'm just like, I want this to be something. And there's just the, it just like was different than what I thought it would be, but whatever, you know, that's part of the game too. It's just like, you figure out what works and what doesn't, what people get offended by and what they don't. And you just roll with it. <laughs> yeah. You just gotta roll with it. And, um, that brings me to my next question because, you know, you have what, like almost like a quarter million Instagram uh, followers. Um, That's and so scary to think about. <laughs> it's really awesome. It's really cool. <laughs> and I saw that was it like maybe two years ago. You went to Art Basel, and yes. um, part of me wonders, like, I want to know how your experience was at Art. Art Basel, because I used to live in Miami and I couldn't afford going to Art Basel when I was there. I was in architecture. I was in graduate school um, studying mm-hmm. architecture. Um, I'm always wondering, like, I feel like such a status for art for art is being in a gallery. But yeah, is an art gallery like just a shopping mall for art and like shopping malls are like going out of business? Does it make more sense to just go all in on like um, selling stuff through your social media and website? I don't know. I, this is something that, like, for example, I have 85,000 TikTok followers. And mm-hmm. I'm talking to my father in law who doesn't know anything about art. He's like super Sicilian, like, like practical to a fault. You know, are you Sicilian? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My mom's side. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm thinking about having an art show. He's like, oh, yeah? Well, uh, how many people can you fit in uh, the art gallery you're thinking about renting out or whatever? I'm like, I don't know, 200 or whatever. And he's like, yeah, how many followers do you have on your online? I said, I don't know, 85,000. He's like, you can't fit 85,000 in the art gallery, can you? I'm like, shit. No, I can't. Yeah. No, you can't. So that's a little antidote, but uh, how was Art Basel? Art Basel for me was literally a party. I did not go to Art Basel itself. I just hung out in Wynwood. Um, (laughs) And that's the way that I wanted it to be. Because for me, like, I'm with you. I would not spend like $60 a day to go look at art 
and this is this is just my opinion. Um, go look at art made by people with MFAs that were paid for by their parents, by their benefit because they're beneficiaries of the trust, and they have way more money than they could ever spend. And they're they've been connected into the art world for generations. So obviously, someone's going to buy their like weird little line work that's you know worth six thousand dollars that I could have made in ten seconds, but so because. True. I'm sorry, but like, I really, the, the institutional art world, the traditional art world to me is literally the same as the stock market because people view these art pieces as assets. They look at them and they think that they, they want to invest in an artist and they want to buy something. And then what they're going to do is let's say they buy a piece for $10,000. The artist like becomes very successful through the course of their career. They end up selling that same art piece for a million dollars in 10 years. And guess who sees the return on that investment? Not the artist. So for me, it's really just like an art collector's game. And um, I am in a few galleries. I don't have a problem with galleries that do it properly. But I think things like Art Basel and things in this like huge traditional art world, to me, it's just like, yeah, that's cool. And maybe I'm just saying this because I don't have an MFA and like my family isn't super connected in art. But like, it's just that world to me seems so ridiculously just like it's just a front for so many things that are just like money making and they don't want to call it that but that's all it is and um yeah i'm it's not really like, like assets you're right it's like buying assets yeah. that could be stored and they could be bought for an insane amount of money probably mm -hmm. money laundering too like oh yeah you know, for sure. that, that, how much did that one banana the that. banana like taped to the wall sold 120, for twenty dollars that's probably just two friends that are like, yo, dude, if you put the banana on the wall, like I'll, I'll Venmo you a hundred K, you know? And then he bought it and then he ate it. Yes. And you're so right about like, I, I studied, I, I got my, um, bachelor's in fine arts and I studied. Ooh, uh, I'm so interested. Tell me more about that. I'm interviewing really? you, you now. Yeah. Tell me more about that. <laughs> I want, I want to, I want that perspective. Uh -huh. So when I respond, I like know what you've done. You know what I mean? Sure. So you want to know about my, my BFA? Yeah, because I have a degree in political science and I was actually going to go to law school. So I'm really good at negotiating. So go for it. <laughs> so, um, gosh, the long story trying to become short is I always wanted to go to art school, but um, my father's a physician. He's, he's a doctor. He's very practical. He's like, mm -hmm. you know, the way I kind of pitched going to like studying art was I, started photojournalism that's how i got ah. in so i was in all photography classes so i could say mm -hmm. hey look i you know there's some kind of job path here but i started to um i was a good shooter but i started to hate it and because i always want to do art so i did like mm -hmm. years of photojournalism and then i finished um doing like fine art photography which is actually when i started collaging fine art photography oh, cool. like, a camera to yeah. make art with and um so my first collages i made were like in 2007 so that was like kind of a weird hey. really around yes. 2007 nice it was literally 2007 yes <laughs> and um i don't i guess i didn't learn my lesson because I graduated around 2007 2008 the economy absolutely crashed and yeah. oh interesting well, they had the housing market collapse. Yeah, yeah, that timing. I was like 12, so I don't, I don't really. Yeah, the timing was that. brutal. <laughs> and so I started um, study. I got my master's in landscape architecture, which is okay. like park design, bike path design, kind of like a, it's like urban design, basically. That and sounds cool. That sounds interesting. It was really cool. I used to do, okay. I used to be a landscaper over the summer, you know, between, you know, college semesters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I loved it. But at the end of the day, any type of architecture field is super, super dry, particularly mm -hmm. if like you're trying to propose a bike path that goes through maybe like two counties, a couple cities, this part of your bike path has to be on city sidewalk. This part's like the railway owns it. So literally mm -hmm. like, people in the urban design field will be wor like, will work on projects for five years to 10 years before mm -hmm. it actually is like built. Oh yeah. So not for I me. I worked in politics. So like my thing was like making sure all the zoning, well, that, well, this wasn't my job, but like, mm -hmm. I know how much like zoning and things go into that. And like, you need the money 
typically and who grants money other than Congress. So, you know, still work in publicly politics. funded things. I did. I did. I don't anymore. Um, I worked on Capitol Hill and then I worked for um, I worked like for the actual party in Maryland. Um, and then I worked in political finance. And then that was the job that I was talking about earlier where I was like, oh, my God, I just don't know what's going on anymore. And that's where post work kind of started. Um, yeah, no, but I get it because in, in my world, in politics, it was a similar sense in a different in a different way that like pretty much like the entry points, the access points were very barred to people who didn't have the connections like your, your degree really didn't matter. Like I, I grew up in a very like STEM environment. Like I, um, my high school was like very STEM based. The founder of Google went to my high school, right? Like I grew up in a college town that was like a huge STEM school. And um, a lot of my friends have like engineering degrees. And for them, like they learned very specific skills that got them very specific jobs where like something like fine art or any liberal arts degree, like sociology, political science, um, literature, anything like that. It's pretty much like, who do you know and who are your parents? And that yeah. was very much my experience. And um, I don't love that. I wish that it was easier for people to get into these things if they had a degree in them, just because I think that the world needs more people who don't have a political background in politics. The world needs yeah. more people who, you know, like aren't the children of the children of the children of the children of these artists making art. Um, you know, I think that we need new perspective and it's, it's working because, and to your point that you were making earlier about like social media and like, is that the future? I think it is. Um, I, there's a documentary called the American meme that's on Netflix that came out, like, I want to say two years ago now. And one of the people that was interviewed in it, she was this girl named Brittany something. And she was a vine person, like a viner. And she moved to LA to be an actress and just couldn't find any gigs. But she got on Vine and started making these six second skits. And she became one of the most popular Viners and then got what she wanted, like through this social media platform, literally was able to become this public figure and actress that she wanted to be. And I think a lot of us have been able to do that because of social media. Like I have absolutely no formal art training. I think art school would have really like drained my energy of like what I like to do. Like the idea of getting critiqued by other people sounds like, no, thank you. I'm that's good. Cool. I know your collages while you're yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's mine. Um, wow. So, so you didn't, nobody taught you how to use. I'm assuming you use Photoshop. Like no yeah, one. Yeah, no, no one taught me. I did that myself. I just learned how to do all this on my own. That is. And um, wow. I figured you straight up like went to college for graphic design. No, I, I want to learn how to make a font. That's where I'm at. I actually like feel really dumb compared to a lot of artists because I don't know a lot of stuff. Like I have a lot of friends who, like I know how to use Blender and Cinema 4D and I know how to use like Unreal and I can build things in this and that and I can use Illustrator, Photoshop, I can do all these things. And I'm like, uh, I can use layer mask and I got a good eye for this. <laughs> like that's really where I'm at, you know? And like, I want to learn yeah. more stuff, but um, it's just interesting that I think that like, I always feel really incompetent when it comes to other artists because I just don't have like the broad range of skills that I think you learn if you go to school for this stuff. Um, your, stuff there, your stuff is awesome. It really is. I mean, thank you. You, your layered horizons and then to me, you sometimes have nods to, I don't know, uh, alchemy, like ancient yes. stuff. Um, I love symmetry and a lot of your stuff is symmetrical. Um, the I like I hear sound when I look at it, the circles and stuff like that are like kind of yeah. me. Well, um, I make a lot of it to music, so that's like absolutely perfect. Oh, nice! I made that on a red eye flight to Washington, D.C. from LAX. It was like it five really in the morning. <laughs> analog collage artist, just so you know, this is one of the, the awesome benefits of doing digital <laughs> collage art is you could do it on your laptop. Chilling on a plane. On an airplane. Oh, that was my favorite place to make art. Was uh, on airplanes. Oh man, I miss that so much. Airplanes are a perfect excuse to sit down with a book. No one can interrupt you. No one can say, "Well, where were you? What were you doing?" It's like, "Oh, sorry, I was stuck," you know, somewhere yeah. or whatever. I miss um, that. So, 
this is a hot button issue. Uh, people ask this a lot. What's that? Go for it. I'm here. Oh, all right. <laughs> um, we've chatted for a bit um, on Clubhouse a couple weeks ago, and yeah, we talked about copyright and derivative work. Um, and you mentioned that you're pretty strict with where you get your source material. And um, could you maybe like share a, a um, you don't have to, but you could maybe share a rule of thumb for us with what you deem is like safe to collage with? Yes, I will talk about that all day um, if you let me. Um, yeah, my <laughs> motto is I would rather my stuff be a little boring and I'm never gonna get sued than doing things in a really like fun way that are illegal. Um, so a lot of artists that are not me get layers and source material from places like Pinterest and Tumblr and like all these random places on the internet that are definitely not cool to find things from. Um, so that being said, I don't do that because like I said, I have a background in politics. I have a background in policy. Um, the law is something that I'm very familiar with. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, I remember when I first started this project, I started making art probably about three or four months before I actually posted anything because I wanted to get caught up on, you know, the copyright issues. Because when I first started making collages, I wasn't do using a computer, right? It was all analog. And like, I mean, in the analog world, at least from what I understand, because I definitely know more about like the digital world now at this point, but like, I would just rip stuff out of magazines and it was totally kosher. It didn't really matter. Right. But like, sure. then it was like, okay, okay. I'm on the internet now. So I don't think that's going to fly. And there's this whole thing that like, you have to know about like resolution in your photos. Like all magazine clippings are going to be the same thing, right? They're going to, you just need to make sure it's that like glossy paper so you can like actually glue it down. It's not going to like seep through and it's not gross. Right. That's like the only yeah. thing you have to worry about, which is mm -hmm. amazing. But Oh my God, when you find the thing and it's on the wrong paper and you can't glue it, I know your pain. I know. I understand. Um, sure. But with, digital art it's like okay there's all these different resolutions and the photos have to be high quality what the hell is dpi it's like you just learn all these different things and um then i started thinking like okay well, but where am i getting these images from and how do i do that properly so really what happened was there was a i had like a moment where i was like i need to look at how pe like i can find these images and do it in a safe way that isn't going to be someone's photo. Like you were saying you did photography. Like I don't, I can't imagine how it would feel being a photographer and watching someone make something with a piece of your art because it is art that like you didn't authorize for them to do. And then it's just yeah. like, that's stealing. So I was just like, I had this like deep empathy and I was like, I need to figure this out. So I looked into it and I found a whole bunch of stuff. You know, I think you can get away with using things that aren't necessarily royalty free. If they have a transformative purpose, you can get away with using things. If um, it's like 30% different. It's also like you can get away with using things if it's over 70 years old because copyright didn't exist back then. Away with certain things. The way yeah. that I kind of feel, I'm not going to mess with any of that. I'm not going to mess with that. I'm going to go to websites where people who upload their things literally have signed in the terms and conditions that you can use their pieces for whatever, whenever, however you want. Because to me, that is like takes away all liability. It takes away all like room for interpretation. If anyone tried to come back and they were like, this is my photo, I'd be like, great, this is your licensing agreement that you signed with this website. And this is what it says. And unfortunately, you do not own the rights to this anymore. Sorry. Um, because to me, like that is going to be the only and the sure, most surefire way that like no one's ever going to come around and be like, hey, this is actually mine because that's happened to me before where people have stolen my art and they've put it on something else or they've used it as a background for their little selfie or whatever. And it sucks. And I would hate to be that person for someone else. So while I might not have really cool like vintage photos of people that people found on Pinterest, uh, all of my art is going to be like free of a lawsuit so for me i can go to bed at night knowing that i'm not going to get sued that's what matters to me <laughs> no, it's, it's really smart it's a really smart policy and i would imagine maybe it helped you get some of the gigs that you have had as a collage artist there could be um people looking for talent and they're like dude i don't know i i can't use that work because it's too derivative from um 
something else, you know? Every time I talk to a client or a potential client, one of the questions they ask me is, where do you get your art from? And will I get sued if I use it? So for me, it's in my best interest to understand how like copyright works and to use images that aren't going to get me or them sued, right? So I find it's really important, I think. And if you're listening and you're like, I don't know how to do that, um, this is my handle right here. Post work. It's flipped. It's flipped, so it's hard. Um, and uh, you can hit me up and ask me more about it because it's kind of boring. But um, it is definitely important. And I think that every collage artist should understand copyright and the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And they should understand like fair use agreements and they should understand like comment, creative commons because all of those things are really important for where you're getting your images from because you never want to be in a position. I never want to be in a position. I can't speak for anyone else. Um, where I'm using something that isn't necessarily proper um, because it could bite me in the butt later. And I don't, sure. I don't want that. So. And there's no, <laughs> like you found a straight answer for a very muddy subject. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Whereas, I think like, a lot of people would rather muddy it up because it keeps it different. It's fun. But for me, I'd, I'd rather play it safe. Yes. And, you know, like people ask me often, um, you know, cause they make lessons on YouTube and stuff and yeah. what's that? Oh yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. YouTube's a lot of work. Oh, but, I'm sure. Uh, it's cool. Cause it kind of lives there forever and people can find it and search, you know, but, um, you know, let's say you're cutting out a magazine and there's like a dude way, way, way far in the corner. And like you take his hand and it becomes part of a much bigger piece. Likely you're going to be fine, but yeah. Each, they're tough questions to answer when people ask me because each piece is different. You could literally right. make 10 collages and one could be like, yo, that's probably not ethical and others probably fine. But that is not to say that someone couldn't just stop you and just give you a cease and desist on something, you know, like, and what are you going to do? Like lawyer up and like fight them, you know, for some corporation or something like that in court? Like, no, you're just going to have to quit. So it's um, good that um, you're careful with that. And I think that's a really good guideline for people to explore for sure. Yeah. There's like some no brainers. Like don't use like logos. Don't use um, brands, you know, don't use like a supermodel's face. Like Gigi Hadid probably has like 70 million lawyers. Like I wouldn't mess with that, you know, <laughs> unless she paid me for it. Um, you know, it's just like one of those things too, that I think it's like some of the stuff, it's just easier to play it safe. That's yeah, really I how I feel. Anything from like, you know, Disney, Star Wars, any of that big comic mm. book stuff. Yeah, no, no. definitely would not um, nope. uh, mess with that. Um, I have like one layer of people dressed in stormtrooper outfits that I found on a website that's free to use things on. And even that scares me. Like mm -hmm. these people yeah. literally bought stormtrooper outfits and it's just regular humans wearing them. And even that terrifies me because I'm like, the, like the thought that, you know, maybe they could come back and say it's still like of the essence. It's just like, I wouldn't want to mess with Lucasfilm. They're like an entity. So yeah. I wonder if you're the only collage artist with a law, with like a, with a politics and law background. It's a very unique, it's a very unique like background to have in collage that's really cool i didn't know that about you i'm the only one that i know of hmm. but that doesn't mean i'm the only one if you are hit me up <laughs> if you are a politician or you've been a political operative or you're a lawyer and you also make art like i do i want to hear from you <laughs> definitely one last thing I'd, I'd like to talk to you about is um this kind of uh, new rat race with video content, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and TikTok are in a battle, it seems, to for the eyes and minds of the world. And they all want us to be making one minute long videos, right? Because TikTok probably stole a lot of people's attention. And we've talked about how this, affects the way that we try to grow our audience. Um, for me, it affected my process. I had success on TikTok because I was making like four a day. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but it's because I was doing that, I was yeah, I was going bonkers. I was yeah. doing a lot of TikTok, but I went from like three three hundred followers to twelve thousand overnight. It was it was super fun. Yeah, yeah, a dream. Yeah, it was really cool. So I've got a few videos with over seven million views on there, and that was just like Hell such yeah. an awesome pat on the back. Yeah. But I'm like, all right, I made progress. But then it's like YouTube wants you to make one minute videos. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Instagram wants you to make one minute videos, but they could, seems like they could read the metadata or whatever the hell it is. And they could tell, no, you posted this on TikTok or you made this in TikTok. We don't, and they, I think they bury it in Instagram and YouTube. That's what I, I, I could totally be wrong. But I think they want natively posted, natively recorded things because they don't want anyone recycling their their TikToks. Maybe I need like no, you. I think you're right, and I'm I'm making this face because I I hate that you're right. Um, because uh, it's I I'm I, the, the enemy is the the apps, right? Um, and I think that like the way that I feel is that I've heard that too, and I what I do to get around that, and I don't really use TikTok that often, but when I do. I record the video just like on my phone and then I just post it to both. So the metadata is on my phone and not on the apps. <laughs> um, That's smart. But, um, it's a huge hack though. You, you know, you laugh at it, but that, that could make, that makes a huge difference, you know? Yeah. And I think for me, I mean, like my thing is I wish that I could post process and have it be interesting for people to look at. Um, my process is not very fun and it's not very pretty. So the way that I kind of see it is like process is not something that I'm like keen on showing people because it's very like trial and error. It's very boring. It's very like, and to me, the way that I feel is like my process is such a sacred part of what I do for me that I'm not going to like put something together and then show someone how to do it and make like a fake process because like that just kind of like takes the magic out of it for me. And right. like at the end of the day, like there's this um infographic thing that's been going around instagram lately and it's like this person's like i'm not creating content for the sake of creating content i'm not going to schedule my posts and like they're really talking about how like a lot of art has been made into content and it hasn't really been art and um it's got me thinking because i do think that like to a point if i am making things in a in a way and in a style or even in a frequency that for me doesn't feel good the, the magic is going to get lost because for me, like I'm not an artist because I, you know, necessarily think I'm good at what I do. I actually like sometimes don't think I'm good at what I do. Um, I'm an artist because apparently in some way, shape or form, the feelings and the inspiration I get from music and the way that I put together like pieces of nature and my experiences resonate with a lot of people. And to me, it's not really about me anymore. Like, I don't think that I'm like some like amazing person in itself. Like, I think I'm a, I'm a channel for people to feel this thing that they need to feel. And it's not about me. It could be anyone else, you know? And it is other people. It's other artists for other people, which is amazing. Um, I'm more concerned that everyone has an ability to feel that way. Um, so that being said, because of that, the idea of like making like a fake process just oh it like makes my heart hurt, right? Sure. Like I'm like, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, but I will say um, I'm probably going to get back on TikTok and like show people the animated stuff that I've been working on with people mm -hmm. um, just because like that is something that I've been doing and it's fun and um, that could be a cool way for them to get a bit of my art and like see it sure. without it like just being like a photo. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I wish I was funny and could. <laughs> I, I can't do that though, and I don't think that's that's not why I'm here. <laughs> I'm here to make art, so it's always interesting. I haven't really figured out a way to get on TikTok. Um, the video thing is just soul crushing for me. I mean, I know that's not the answer you want, but it is what it is. Um, I don't know how to do it. it bothers me. A, f a friend of mine who uh, really inspired me to really get on social media and, and stuff like this, uh, he's a puppet maker and he's created um, a really awesome kind of network of fans. And um, he's got like 70,000 YouTube followers, he's got like a really engaged audience. And um, one thing he told me is he treats 
each social media like a, a different thing you know he considers mm -hmm. like instagram is like um the art gallery and tiktok is behind the scenes which i thought was like a clever way to do it because you know mm -hmm. he's like soldering armatures and he's like you know sewing um puppet pelts you know like the skins on them and stuff like that um so it's another way that people could look at the different social media accounts it's like you know what i'm not going to make videos of my tiktok process but maybe i could you know shoot the shit about the grand canyon or just share interesting facts i don't know there's like we don't necessarily have to like go like right in the pocket of our art i think in the different social media platforms um i don't know just a different way to look at it you know right in the pocket and i like that and that's true and i think you have to have a different voice on different platforms because it's like a different language and you're right i think you're totally right i think for me what it comes down to as well is like and this is my own limitation i wish i could do what you do is i don't want to spend any more goddamn time on the internet i want to make art right like all i want to do is just make art i would love if i could have a team of like 15 year olds that are like this TikTok would be sick you should make this and i'd be like cool let's do it and then they post it <laughs> and like i don't have to do any of the heavy lifting because for me like the idea of spending more time on social media is literally soul crushing i want to spend more time in photoshop i want to spend more time making art i want to spend more time learning art um sure. not just like marketing it. you feel like you like learn the game i mean like you you gained a ton of instagram followers and i'm sure you really had to get into the meta of like how it works and like what like what works for you and like it's a grind it really is and i guess i always instagram is my sixth sense what's that i have a, I have a six sixth sense for instagram like i can wake up be like the api is different they changed the API on the first, I could feel it. Like that's how much time I spent on Instagram. Like I can tell like little shifts and like it's disgusting because like there is no platform that I could spend that much time on and master the way that I have with Instagram. I need to though, because I mean, there's other things out there, but um, I mean, TikTok, I mean, like you said, 12,000 followers in one night, like that algorithm is bonkers. Like that's so perfect. That's like 12,000 people that want what you are doing so quickly. Like that's amazing. It took me, yeah. that, that's like a month in a good month of followers, right? Like overnight, that's incredible, dude. <laughs> like, you know. I, I can't believe you got, t I mean, t well, I can believe you got 12,000 a month, but I've I been- I don't really anymore. I've been posting on Instagram for a couple of years now and I only got like 4,000 followers. But your, your, your stuff is cool. I think that's the thing, like the process, people love seeing that on TikTok. I, I think it's cool. Like I'm, I'm, I'm a harsh critic of myself as well. Like that's why mm -hmm. I didn't like, I didn't even make art for years because I was like, mm -hmm. no, that's stupid. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. I, under I do understand that. I do get it. Um, I go through those phases, you know? I, completely, well, I think any artist feels that that's the thing it's like if you're watching this and you're like oh my god like i'm the only artist in the world that hates my work sometimes like you're not um there's a lot of people that feel it the way you feel and you're not alone <laughs> yes i read in uh oscar wilde said in picture of dorian gray if i'm gonna butcher this quote but he said um the things artists detest the most the most is art <laughs> yes so many oh, levels man. So, many, uh, so many levels right yes. but um oh my god needless to say even though we sometimes detest art i'm sure you're working on some cool stuff and um maybe a way we could um wrap this up if there's anything else you want to share maybe what you're working on now where people could find you what are you excited about mm. right now i just built my first nft drop oh yes. i wanted to ask you about that please tell please oh tell. we could have talked about nfts forever um so i if you are unaware an nft is a non-fungible token fungible means not you fungible means not unique non-fungible unique so it's so a unique token that. that you own a specific edition of a piece and it gets minted on the blockchain 
to some people, that's the equivalent of the certificates that people gave you for Christmas that say you owned a quarter size of a land mass somewhere, right? Or you like own a cow, you know, that's what, for some people, that's what it sounds like. But the reality is that in the future, a lot more things are going to be put on the blockchain and it's going to be a very easy and categorized way to determine what is on the internet and what is not um, the blockchain and just like the metaverse in general has its own currency. You've probably heard of Bitcoin. You've probably heard of Ethereum. There's a whole bunch of others. Uh, the value yeah, of that currency, right. that currencies change often, right? So you get people who trade Bitcoin all the time because the value is constantly fluctuating um, because it's not a standardized form of currency like the USD is. Um, so the idea of an NFT is like you buy a unique token of a piece of art. So if I had 10 editions of one piece of art, if you owned one of those 10, there's only nine others. They're all minted on the blockchain and you own that piece exactly where it's at. Um, and the basically acts almost like a supercomputer that can verify to everyone else that like, hey, this person owns this. And it's like immutable. Like it's always going to be there forever and ever. Unless a freaking and, meteor like smashes the earth. Right. And I think the one thing for artists who might be like, what's the point? Why would someone want that? Is because if I sold one piece, it was a one of one on the blockchain, it gets mid to one person. Let's say you buy it and then you sell it to someone else. I'm going to still get commission on your sale. So unlike that art gallery situation where the collector bought a piece of art from someone for $10,000 and then sold it later for a million, you would see 10% of that a million dollars if that yeah. happened, which is beautiful. So in a lot of ways, when I think of the future of like digital art in general, like I think of it as something that happens literally on the blockchain, because in a way, like a lot of galleries, like they're snooty towards like digital artists. They're like, I cannot sell this. This is unsellable. It's like, uh, according to who, because I sell it all the time. Um, uh -huh. I had someone in Clubhouse tell me that once. They're like, your art's not sellable. And I was like, I've sold over 4,000 prints in three years. My art's not sellable? To who? Hey, um, they're people and, trying to climb that Clubhouse ladder. You gotta, <laughs> they're gonna start throwing insane. elbows in there. Oh my yeah, God. Yeah, literally. So it was just, it was just like, that was such a whack opinion, you know? But it's like, the idea with like an NFT is like, it creates like this digital space for this digital art. And like, it's really exciting. So the pieces that I made, there's three of them to start. They're 10, 20 and 30 second loops. They have audio on them and they're, they're animated versions of my art. Um, I'll have more information as I have it, but that's what I know right now. That's what I just finished working on. I'm working on the second drop right now too. Um, aside from that. What platform are you on for your NFTs? Is there like, are you on um, Rarible or what? Is there like a certain? TBD? Um, uh, I'm not really, I'm not like a, a like leisure to say at the moment. Um, gotcha. I'll have more information about that like later, but um, it's exciting and I'm excited to do this. Um, but it's also like kind of weird, right? Cause it's just like, it's like this weird world where like you see artists on Twitter, most of the NFT stuff happens on Twitter and you'll see artists that are like, Oh my God, I made like a bazillion dollars in three hours. And you're like, when is this even real? You know, it's just crazy. Serious um, FOMO. I think, um, as, as far as like, you know, your political and like legal background, I think um, I did hear someone say a really cool application that NFTs could have um, on Clubhouse. He was saying like, let's say for example, you're the Rolex company and in like 20 different airports, you have like those scrolling banners, banner ads showing like mm -hmm. a luxury lifestyle, like, you know, Corona beer type shit, you know, where you're like hanging back or whatever there's there's a chance that like rolex could buy an artist's nft right mm -hmm. and then display it on all of these uh platforms like around the world and all of their like you know rolex stores or whatever and you know it's easier for them because they know it's like a legal deal they own this thing and you could get like a commission every time it's projected or used or sold you know? So that comes down to the smart contract. Um, smart. And I actually don't, yeah, I don't really know too much about like actual like NFT smart contracts yet, just because I haven't looked into it. Um, that's definitely going to be like my next bit of homework because I am interested in how like these smart contracts work. And there's a few different ones, right? So that would truly come down to like the smart contract and what the person who buys the NFT can legally do with it. 
Um, it just depends. And like any contract, there's going to be variation and the two parties are going to have agreements and disagreements and you're going to sign it and it's going to be fine. Um, with the case of NFTs, you've signed the agreement before someone can bid or buy your piece. So you already know what's in there. Um, these platforms have come up with these like blanket smart contracts, which is why people are selling on platforms because it just makes uh, it easier, right? Gotcha. It makes it easier. It makes yeah. easier. But um, I do think that we are going to see some lawsuits come out of NFTs. I think something like what you're talking about, where um, a big brand uses something commercially that wasn't really necessarily given to them for commercial purposes. Mm. Might get a little sticky, um, especially if those royalties are not paid. We'll just see. It's, it's just going to, this is so new and it's going to be around. I don't think it's a bubble. Yeah, it's just a I rush, think people, right? are, people are looking at the flashy prices people are getting like, that's silly, you know? But I think people are really underestimating Especially like, like I would add if my recommendation would be for anyone listening, like I like find out more about smart contracts because it's gonna make it's gonna revol revolutionize so many things. Like it's particularly if it gets cheaper to mint or the or gas or whatever. I mean, like the other day I rented the Wolf of Wall Street on the PlayStation Network. I have a PlayStation. I could have bought it for fourteen dollars. Mm -hmm. But when you buy a movie on the Apple Network or your PlayStation or your Roku, do you really feel like you own it? No, you don't feel like you mm -hmm. own it. But what, what if mean. you have a smart contract on that thing? Yeah. And you're like, okay, you know what? I watch Wolf of Wall Street, but I'm gonna sell it to my buddy Tom. And like that contract executes, and like you get 10 bucks, Leonardo DiCaprio gets a quarter, you know, Fox Entertainment gets four dollars, and so on and so forth. Like I think potentially all that could happen. And then all this kind of digital junk we have could be traded and sold like indefinitely. And well, that's the decentralization right. aspect of it. Right. And I think that that's, what's yeah. so cool. And I think that's, what's going to be really exciting to watch for is just like seeing how art becomes intentionally and increasingly decentralized. I'm very excited to see that. Really so cool. I hear you. Yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that works. Um, but yeah, I'm doing my first NFT drop soon. Um, you can find me on Instagram, pretty much, always. Post you can yeah. find me on Twitter, postwork, postwork. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, but I don't know why you would. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I try to read every single Instagram message I get. So if you need, if you have any questions about anything, I've let me know and I'll try to explain it. Um, you can find me on. When I first started out, you responded to me, and it was very um, generous of you. And I want to thank you very yeah. much. Cool. Yeah. Cool. This was great. I'm glad we got to do this. Definitely, I'm excited for your NFT drop, and um, best of luck to you. I hope you have Thanks. a really enjoyable summer. You too. All right. I'll talk to you soon.